Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Christ Church. Uh, there will be a brief consistory meeting right after the service today. Uh, we're going to meet over in the in the room there to the right side. Uh, consider staying for Sunday school. We have Sunday school for all ages. Also, uh, Jewel Women's Center is doing their annual baby, baby bottle fundraiser. Uh, you should have it back by next week. Yeah. But uh, if it's a little later, Jonathan, right? If it's a little later, you bring the bottle uh, back. Yeah, they, they will take them anytime. They will take they them. Have an offering to give, so. Yep, they will be thankful for that. Today is uh, Tag Trampoline Fun. Yeah, that's for the younger people. <laughs> uh, Monday is the Emmaus Reunion Prayer Group. Prayer requests are welcome. Contact Jane Shellhammer. Ham Shell yeah, Shellhammer, Sandy Rumble, or Connie Fetzer. Hey, I'm always missing. Uh, Tuesday is Adult Bible Study because of Lent. Uh, they've been scheduled for a Tuesday instead of Wednesday. Uh, Wednesday, the uh, Lenten service is going to be up at uh, Zion Church in Lewistown Valley. Thursday is J2O. Monday, March the 4th, is Circle of Friends. Terry, do you have anything to mention? Uh, I am not the president anymore. Betty Kay is. Oh, okay, Betty Kay, is there anything special with Circle of Friends? If you are looking for something to do on a Monday in March, come join us for Circle of Friends. Um, we always have interesting programs, and the food is always really good, and we'd like to have you. Oh, wow, that's okay. It's an invitation, an open invitation, and I think it's for women and also men, correct? You're welcome to come, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, I stepped into that one. <laughs> Tuesday the 5th uh, is a Soup Kitchen. Jane, anything with Soup Kitchen? Hi, uh, anyone can come and help. We start at 12 noon cooking, and uh, we're gonna make spaghetti this time. So <coughs> if you have a dessert you'd like to offer, or we could use salad bags to make salad, um, that would always be appreciated. And we have takeout, so if you want to do a takeout or if you have a neighbor that you know could use an extra ham, please stop by and take them a meal. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Uh, two weeks from now is going to be Circle Friends Hosses Day. Uh, the cards are out in the break front there. Uh, you do need a card to uh, present to them for Circle of Friends to get, uh, I think it starts out at 20%, is that right? Correct? And if we go over a certain amount, it goes up to 25%. So just remember uh, to get one of those cards. Well, March 16th already is Easter egg hunt. These things are all in your bulletin. I won't spend too much time. Uh, but there is, uh, we are looking for plastic eggs and individ individually wrapped candy. Uh, there's a box out in the narthex for uh, those dona donations. Uh, it's ages 0 to 12, welcome. Uh, also March 17th, on Sunday, uh, 12, 12 p.m. to 2 p.m. is uh, Christ Church Tag Bowling Party at Spare Time alley, Bowling Alleys in Hometown. Uh, there's more information in there about that. Also, November 16th, 2024 at 3 p.m. is the church trip to Sight and Sound Theater in Lancaster to see Daniel. Mark, are you? Yeah, uh, this yeah. week we're going to order them, so make when, sure. When is it? What is it? November 16th. This week we're going to order them, so make sure you sign up today. Okay, so that's important. If you're going to go this week, you have to make sure you're signed up. Uh, when, uh, when do you need the payment uh, this week then, Mark? No, not right away, but um, I mean, I don't know that we have a schedule, but you know, whenever you can. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mark. Uh, we're looking for someone to open up, uh, or yeah, someone to head up 
the uh, food pantry, if you're interested, see Pastor Jonathan and he can give you more details about uh, what that would entail, what responsibilities you would have. Also, uh, volunteers are needed to help with the Lenten skips. There's a sign-up sheet on the break front. Just write your name next to the week. You can help. Any questions, see Susan Markavich. Uh, Pastor Heim is looking for volunteers to help with the Good Friday drama at 7 p.m. at the 7 p.m. service here at Christ Church. There's a sign-up sheet on the break front. Any questions, see Pastor Heim. Late in offering boxes, yeah, yeah, there are people some assembling some of them. They are a little bit of a, a test of patience to assemble them. So there are some assembled if you want them. Uh, are there any additional announcements at this time uh, from the choir? No, I think we're done. Far left section. Center right section. left. I'm sorry, oh. center right. Hello. <laughs> um, I, we have two more spots for the Latin skits. If anybody wants to sign up, it's in the back. Thank you. And the far right section. Also, I did forget, uh, there is also for the, uh, the flower order, there are hydrangeas and also tulips. And that's due next week, March the 3rd. So please keep that in mind if you want to order those. Jonathan, did you have something? Yeah, just regarding the consistory meeting, uh, since we're meeting in the conference room, uh, the confirmands can go over to the youth building with Mark uh, in the meantime. I'll be in with that meeting anyway, so. All right, thank you. If there's no other announcements, we'll continue with the service. Thank you.
my people, in the assembly, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, honor him. Revere him, all you descendants of Israel. For he has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry for help. From him comes the theme of my praise in the great assembly. Before those who fear you, I will fulfill my vows. The poor will eat and be satisfied. Those who seek the Lord will praise him. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations will bow down before him. For the dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. Amen. Please be seated. Sure. Well, I was reading Matthew chapter 22, verse 2, about the parable of the wedding, um, the wedding banquet, and I know it's about the kingdom of God, and that the king sent out his servants to invite all the people, both good and bad. Then he states, but when the king came into the banquet to see the guests, he noticed the man there was not wearing wedding clothes. He then asked the man and the man had no excuse for it, and so he was thrown out. I'm concerned. How do we know if we are dressed well enough for the wedding? Do you see everyone here? The people here today are examples of people that came to the wedding banquet. Being dressed is not just about being seekers of the truth, loving God and following him. Jesus washed the disciples' feet. When he came to Peter, he at first said no to having his feet washed by Jesus. Why is that? Well, Peter thought he was saying he wasn't worthy. But Jesus said to him, unless I wash you, you have no part of me. Peter, Peter then replies, then wash my whole body. Jesus said a person who has had a bath needs only to wash his feet. Their whole body is clean. It states this in John chapter 13 somewhere. Oh, I think I get it now. So we are called to invite everyone, but God will only accept those who are dressed in the cloak of God's grace. I notice it says after that that Peter was clean, though not everyone there was clean. Yes, that person was Judas, and that is why Satan was able to enter him when he took bread from Jesus. For example, King David did some pretty awful things. He was an adulteress and a murderer. However, God later called him a man after his own heart because he turned his life over to God and repented for his sins. The point is, do we want to seek the truth and follow God? Or do we think we know better and refuse to wear the wedding clothes and follow our own desires? Don't be like Judas, where his heart wasn't clean. We can go through the motions but if we don't let Jesus clean us, we will not have any part of him. I hope all of us here will be dressed properly for the wedding banquet. Me too. Let us prepare by reading God's word, repent for our sins, and listening to the Holy Spirit. Let Jesus make us born again and become a new creation. This way, we will be prepared when Jesus comes for us. But if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just, and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So together, let us pray the prayer of confession. Father God, we have gathered here this morning in humble repentance for straying from your ways. Give us penitent hearts and an uncompromising faith to hold fast to the unchangeable truth of your word, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever. Amen. Lord, have mercy upon us.
have mercy upon us. God has promised us his mercy, and in Jesus Christ has died for our sins, so that we may live in newness of life, obedient to his will. Therefore I announce in the name of Christ that your sins are forgiven, according to his promise in the gospel, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Please stand and join us as we sing Death Will Arrest Him.
scripture lesson for today comes from the book of Romans, chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. That is found on page 1,750 in your pew Bible. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if, while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Here is the reading of God's holy word. May the Lord grant his blessing to the hearing and to the reading of it. Let's bow our heads and pray together this morning. Well, we praise you, almighty God, for all you are, for all you have done for us. You are the hope of all the ends of the earth. You formed the mountains by your power, still the raging seas and waves, and calm the turmoil of this world. You provide for your creation in abundance. You are God, our Savior. And we give you praise, Lord, because you deserve it. There is no one else like you. You're the only eternal God, the only God full of such amazing power. You are the only one worthy of honor and glory. It is by your hand and through your working that everything else is here. The earth is sustained by your hand. We are given our breath by your work. You made us all unique and with special intent that we would be your image and your likeness in this world. Everything we have comes from you. And everything we do, we want to do for your glory. So that all creation sees us, sees you through us, and understands how amazing you are, and gives you the glory and honor that you deserve. And so even though all humanity was made in your image and designed to reflect you to creation, we know we are the lucky ones on this earth to know who you are. And while we come here every Sunday and worship you, Take your Holy Spirit with us as we go outside these walls. The rest of the world can only wonder and can only guess at what we have come to know about you. But Lord, we pray today that you would open the eyes of the blind, give hearing back to the deaf, and soften those hardened hearts so that they would see you. We desire for the people of this world to know you more just as we desire to continue to know you better and better as our walk with you continues each day. We want all the world to know that you are our Savior and our God, Lord of all creation, and that you have made this life worth living, given us purpose, given us hope through the work that your Son did on the cross for us. We thank you, Lord, this Lenten season for his sacrifice, we thank you for his willingness to take our punishment upon himself and make it possible for us to know you this way. And we pray that we can help others to find you as well. And Father, we understand why your son had to take that punishment for us. We know we are all sinful people. We have lived in ways that are against your will. But we thank you for your greatest act of love, sending your son to take our place. And we know, Lord, you desire that we be changed and made to look more and more like the life your son set an example for us. So we confess our sins to you this morning, Lord, and come before you with hearts full of repentance. It's your love and your grace that makes us want to change and turn from our old ways of life 
and move toward this new life that you created for us. So we thank you for the promise of forgiveness and the hope that only comes through knowing what you did for us. And Lord, as we come before you this morning, seeking to praise you and asking for your blessings, we know there are many in this world who are struggling with so many things right now. So we lift up to you those who are struggling, those who need your healing, those who need your comfort and strength. We especially lift up those who are on our prayer list this morning. These are the people that we love, that we care about, and we ask that your hand be with them. And Lord, we lift up Jess to you. We thank you for her ministry, and we pray that you continue to bless her as she seeks to proclaim the name of your son to those who've never heard him before. We pray for Teresa and Sandy, Lillian and Dane, Debbie, Tom and Paul, Doris, Oline, and Brett. We lift up Pam to you, Lindsay, Amanda, and Jill, Penny, Barb, Loretta, Michelle. We pray for Aaron, Johanna, Tim, Melinda, Robin, and Dick. We pray for the people of Ukraine and the people of Israel and ask that you bring peace to those nations. And we pray for a spiritual wall of protection around Christ Church, the faith family, and all of us worshiping you here this morning. And Lord, we also pray for those who we speak out in agreement today as we lay them before your throne. Yes, Lord, we lift all this to you. And we thank you so much for hearing our prayers and we look forward to seeing how you will answer. And Lord, we also pray for your church today. We ask that you be with those around the world who suffer because they have called upon the name of your son. Protect them from your enemies. Give them peace and security in their trials, but also give them boldness and strength to cling to you no matter what trials lie ahead. And for those of us who are in safer places, Lord, make sure that we are committed to you. Give us reason and opportunity to show that we are your people, that we trust you with everything, and that no one and nothing on earth can separate us from your love as we have come to know it through your Son. And finally, Lord, we lift up our own needs to you. We ask for your blessing to be upon us as we struggle through whatever trials and temptations stand before us. Keep us close to you. Help us to rely on your strength in everything. Bring us peace in the midst of our questions and concerns. We know that you are God, and we know you will always do what is best for us, protecting us and guiding us until the day it is time that we join you in paradise. So we give all these things up to you, Lord, lifting them up through your Son and our Savior, Jesus the Christ, who taught us to pray when he walked on earth with us the first time, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Continue our service by taking our offering.
share this news with our unbelieving friends and family, Lord, that while they may hate him right now, Lord, that your son Jesus died for them, and that they would come to believe this and have a saving knowledge of you. We pray all this in the name of the one who came to show us the way and died for all of us, your son Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen. Could I have the children join me up front this morning? Ooh, they're in a rush today. Good. <laughs> well, were you afraid somebody was going to take your seats? <laughs> well, good morning, boys and girls. How's everybody doing today? Well, now, you guys may all remember that last week was just a couple days after Valentine's Day. So we are talking about love. Because Valentine's Day is a holiday about love, sharing the love that you have with those closest to you. But obviously the season of Lent too is about Jesus and God's love for us and what they did for us. And so today we're gonna talk about what uh, Jesus talked about love in these things called parables. Now have you guys ever heard a parable before? Do you know what that means? Well, a parable is a story, and Jesus used them all the time, that you talk about different things, maybe things that people have gone through themselves, uh, different stories that uh, give situations that point to something else, though. So, like, Jesus is talking about real-life people in some of the stories, but really they point to uh, God and Jesus and things that they're doing uh, for us up in heaven. So, for instance, there's one really good parable about love. And it's the love that God has for us. And Jesus tells that story of a man who didn't want to uh, listen to his father, didn't want to live under his house anymore. And so he asked his father for all his inheritance. And he went and he took that inheritance and he uh, went away and lived somewhere else, away from his father, away from his family. And he used up all that inheritance. And so when he used it up, he thought, well, you know what? I have uh, at my home a father who I know treats his servants really well, and even though I disobeyed my father, even though I took uh, what I really shouldn't have from him, I will go back to him and uh, ask that he just let me live in the house as one of his servants so that he can continue to survive since he lost all his money and everything. But when he got home, do you guys know what the father did? Have you heard this story before? But when he got home... The father saw him coming, and the father ran up to him, and he gave him a big hug because he missed him so much, and he said, son, I'm going to bring you back in. You're going to be just like one of my sons once again, and he threw a big banquet for his son because even though he was once lost and ran away from home, he had come back, and so that parable is something that maybe has happened to some people in real life. Jesus made up that story, but maybe something like that has happened, but of course it happens with all of us in our relationship with God. And even though we can be far away from God for a long time, we can always come back and uh, God will always accept us just like the Father did in that story. So that's what a parable is. And Jesus used parables to teach love all the time. And he used another one that I'm pretty sure you guys heard called the Good Samaritan. Have you guys heard that one before? And so Jesus uh, talks about the love he and the Father have for people in the first parable. But the Good Samaritan is a parable about how we can show love for other people. And so you guys remember that story, how the man was uh, beat up and left to die on the side of the road, and some people walked by him. That should have helped him. They were religious leaders, and they should have known uh, that it was right for them to help that man. 
but along came somebody that uh, was a Samaritan, and they would have never <coughs> expected him to help, but he did. He helped, and he showed love, and uh, the kind of love that we need to show to everybody around us. And so we need to take that love that Jesus has for us and try to uh, show it and talk to others about it, sh share those parables with them, uh, so that they know the love of Jesus and they know the love that we can have for them as well. So let's all bow our heads and pray. Well, Father God, we thank you so much for your love that you have so many different ways that you love us uh, more than we can ever imagine, Lord. And we just pray that we can see that love that you have and extend that love to other people, both so that they know your love, but also so that they can see that we love them as well. And we want to be people that help others and uh, treat them the way that they deserve to be treated. So we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. We have plenty of goodies here today. So everybody can take one and go back to their seats. His name is Walter McMillan, known to his friends as Johnny D, and he's been on death row in Alabama's Holman Prison for almost six years. Was he, in fact, the man who walked into a dry cleaning store in Monroeville, Alabama in November of 1986 and robbed and murdered the clerk? Or did they get the wrong man? And is the real murderer still out there somewhere? A jury was convinced they got the right man, but you may not be after you watch this story. The clerk who was murdered was 18-year-old Rhonda Morrison, the only child of Charles and Bertha Morrison, who have no doubt that Walter McMillan did it and want him executed as soon as possible. Johnny D says they want to execute the wrong man. You didn't kill Rhonda. No, sir, I ain't never seen Rhonda Morrison a day in my life. God knows I ain't. Where were you on the day of the murder? At my house. Did you ever go into Monroeville on, on the day of the no, murder? No, sir. You never went into town? Never went to Monroeville, period. McMillan is certainly not a typical death row inmate. He had a good job in the logging business, no prior felony convictions, and lived with his family near Monroeville his entire life. 
Police didn't arrest McMillan until seven months after the Morrison murder, a crime which had the police stumped. They had no fingerprints, no telltale ballistics tests, no physical evidence of any kind linking McMillan or anyone else to the crime. McMillan's friends and family testified he was at a fish fry at his house on the morning of the murder, working on the pickup truck he supposedly drove to the cleaners. We talked to his friend, Jimmy Hunter. And that was the truck you were working on that That's day? Right. The transmission was out of it. Was out of the truck? Yeah, I had to clean out. You had so to get them out. <laughs> you couldn't have driven the truck anywhere. No. Johnny D's attorney, Brian Stevenson, has appealed the cases of more than a hundred death row inmates. I, I have never had a case where the state's only evidence of guilt comes from one person, where there's no motive, there's no physical evidence, uh, there's no corroborating circumstances, there's nothing but the word of one person. That one person is Ralph Myers, a career criminal who's now doing 30 years for another murder. Well, we could continue watching, but then I wouldn't have anything to talk about today. <laughs> Maybe by some chance, some of you remember this story from 1992. Well, obviously, I was not alive yet to remember it. But I've read a great deal about it in one of the most troubling, but also one of the most moving books I've ever read, entitled Just Mercy, written by the defense attorney for this case, Brian Stevenson. And I'd recommend the book to anyone, although I did hear they made it into a movie in 2019. I have not seen that, though. It's more or less an autobiography of Stevenson's work as an attorney. And in 1989, after graduating from Harvard, Stevenson travels to Alabama with the goal of defending those who could not afford proper representation. He ends up finding a special niche with that arena with the help of a colleague forge and forms an organization called the Equal Justice Initiative. And much of his work is done with death row inmates who are trying to make appeals regarding their trials and sentences. And the primary case he describes in the book is this one, Walter McMillan's. McMillan continued to hold on to his innocence every second of his original trial and as he awaited the death he was sentenced to. Once Stevenson takes up the case, he starts digging and finds the primary testimony against McMillan is full of contradictions, and like they said, given by a known felon who later on that 60 Minutes episode says that he lied about his testimony. He also learns that another supposed witness was miles away from the scene of the crime with a friend of McMillan's. So Stevenson continues on in his appeals, receives backlash from local cops and prosecutors in the process, but finally, a couple months after this aired in 1992, Stevenson appeals to the judge, and even the county prosecutor stands alongside Stevenson supporting the appeal. And just like that, McMillan goes from being a death row inmate to a free man. He goes from a man charged with murder to a man deemed innocent of all crimes. You can only imagine the emotions that must have been running through McMillan and his family that day. That immediate change the immediate relief from knowing he was not facing the punishment anymore, and from the change in how some people, including the prosecutor, viewed this man, once a heinous criminal, but considered now a law-abiding citizen. Now, I share this story because it is perhaps the closest comparison I can think of in this world of what we are talking about this morning, although it certainly falls short and pales in comparison to it. We continue this week looking at the blood of Christ, and that blood we remember every time we join together at the Lord's table and celebrate his last supper. The blood that we recognize was shed for our salvation. So last week we saw that blood is the propitiation for our atoning sacrifice for sins. God's wrath rightfully comes against sins, and we needed a way to appease that wrath, but there was nothing we could do. So God sent Jesus to be that propitiation that appeased the wrath of God for each one of us. He faced the penalty, he experienced the wrath, and now we do not have to face it ourselves. So this morning, we are considering a passage just a few pages later in our Bibles, still within Paul's letter to the Christians in Rome. We need to have in mind our discussion from last week about God's wrath and Christ's propitiation, because it all works together for Paul's argument and teaching. Between last week's passage and this week's, Paul is using a lesson from Israel's past to talk about our primary subject for this morning. He's describing how Abraham was justified before God. In other words, how he was deemed righteous. Paul takes us back to Abraham's story and points to a verse in chapter 15 of Genesis where it says, 
Abraham believed the promises that God was making to him, and it was credited to him as righteousness. That same truth applies to us. And it's that truth that Luther came across in his studies that spurred him to take actions that would lead to the Protestant Reformation. Our justification comes by faith, not by works of the law, and trying to be a good person in God's sight. So that brief summary brings us to our passage this morning, and we specifically want to take a look at verse 9 of chapter 5 to see what Paul has to say about the blood of Christ. Since we have been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from the wrath of God through him? That word justified, or justification, is what I want us to consider deeply this morning. As products of the Reformation, worshiping in a church that gives Reformation Day its due diligence every year, you've certainly heard that word plenty of times. You may have noticed Paul used it in our scripture lesson last week, continues using it in between here and there and more than once in the passage Pastor Mark read. It's a word we probably associate greatly with our salvation, but may not always think too deeply about. However, unlike propitiation, it is a word we are more likely to know and use outside the religious setting, which makes sense because even in Paul's world, it was not really a religious word. It was a word Paul is pulling from the secular world, using it to describe this effect that Christ's blood has on us. The word justified finds its home in the legal world, which is why Walter McMillan's story provides such a good real-life illustration. The Webster definition says it means the action of showing something to be right or reasonable. A punish, a punishment could be justified. That is to say, it is the right and proper punishment. The example Paul gives about Abraham focuses on Abraham's righteousness. And so from a theological perspective, it means to be declared or remain righteous in the sight of God. For someone to be justified, they have had a legal declaration made about them by God himself. And the Bible is full of this word, both Old and New Testament. In the Old Testament, the judges were expected to justify the righteous. In other words, put them forward as innocent. Tell the world that they did nothing wrong, and of course then not hand down any punishment upon them. On the flip side, the opposite of justify in the Bible and in the legal system is most often condemn. They were con uh, told to condemn the wicked. These people are declared guilty of their crimes and punished accordingly. This was a big deal in the ancient world and still should be today. God often calls out wicked judges. In Proverbs, it says, those who justify the wicked and those who condemn the innocent are both alike. They are an abomination to the Lord. And of course, we see at first, this is exactly what happened to Walter McMillan. He was declared guilty, condemned and sentenced for something he did not do and spent six years of his life waiting for that sentence to be carried out. But then after everything was said and done, he was justified, declared to be not guilty of those crimes, and his punishment was taken away. He didn't have to face it anymore. Didn't have to wonder in the back of his mind how much longer he had to keep his fight going before it would be too late. The courts declared him righteous when it came to the accused crime. Now, I said it's one of the closest examples I could think of to compare with what is happening to us, but really it pales in comparison. Macmillan was innocent. His justification made sense. He was finally declared righteous in this case because it was true. But let, re let me remind you once more what we said last week. God's wrath is not against righteous people. God's wrath is against sinners. As Jonathan Edwards says, God abhors us sinners more than we abhor the most venomous snakes. In other words, we are guilty. And I am confident everyone in this room knows it. When we were talking about sins in confirmation class a few weeks ago, one of the students said it's pretty obvious from the stories they share themselves and the things they do in class that all of them are sinners. And the same is true for all of us. Our sin is real. Our guilt, when it comes to the laws of God, should be obvious were we to stand before any righteous judge. And we should be anticipating condemnation. We should be expecting a punishment to fall on us. We have nothing in us that should make us think, no, I'm innocent. And I should make an appeal, and maybe some other judge in some other court is going to see the evidence that proves I'm innocent. And they will justify me. After everything we talked about last week, 
every we, everything we can think of that we did in our past. Only a fool would think, I deserve justification instead of condemnation. And yet, Paul says, we are justified. Well, how in the world could we be justified? Only a judge that justifies the wicked would say that about us. And we were just reading a passage that said, those judges are an abomination to the Lord. Is God a lousy judge? He can't really be an abomination to himself. Is he just sweeping everything under the rug and looking past it? That doesn't sound like the God we worship. He can't really do that. And he can't be the same judge that he also calls an abomination. And nowhere in the Bible does it teach that that's what he does. So I heard Dominic Bradbury ask, how am I justified then? So Dom, come up here and I'm going to show you. Give Dom a round of applause. He's a little nervous. But he has it easy. So just for a bit of backstory, there's a professor at the seminary that loved to use object lessons, Dr. Buckwalter. He was actually here for, you can stand down here. He was actually here for my ordination and used an object lesson that day as well. Stand over on that side, please. And so he used this object lesson in class when I was, uh, we were working through the Book of Romans and it shocked me to no end. So here we go. You ready, Dom? Dom, are you a sinner? Yeah? Okay, good. At least we agree on that. Okay, Dom, put your hand flat. You can roll up your sleeves a little bit. Put your hand flat on. Okay, yeah, flat like that. So, Dom, last week you didn't do your homework. And probably disrupted in class a little bit, so. That represents those sins there. Let's see. What else did you do? I bet you were mean to your sister one day recently. Did you like chicken sauce? No. <laughs> right. What else did you do? You got anything to confess today? No. <laughs> you cheated off your friend's work in school? Well, I'm glad you admitted that. But it still, seems, still goes on there. Let's see. What else? I'm sure at some point you lied to your parents. I won't ask you when or put you under the bus too hard. You like strawberry jelly? Okay. I got one more, so we might as well. What else did you do? Uh, well, who knows? Call me name. Call Mark a mean name. <laughs> <laughs> Call Mark a mean name. So there's some ranch dressing for you. There. So that represents just a little bit of your sin. Right? I could have probably covered you head to toe in ketchup. <laughs> but that sweatshirt's too nice for that. And it's the same with all of us. This is just a sliver of the sin that we have. And we got nothing that we can do with it. God sees this. He knows it. We deserve to be punished for it. But yet it says he justifies us. And that's because God has taken it. And he's decided that he can put it on to someone else. Oh. <laughs> that is just for a He's decided that he can take it and he can put it on someone else. Okay, Dom. There's a sink in that room over there. You can go watch out. Where? In the room off the sanctuary. And that shock that all of you had should really be the same shock that we all have at the gospel message and what Paul is saying to us today. All of your sin, all of your guilt, all the condemnation that you deserved, Paul says that Jesus Christ took it away from you and he has put it on himself. In 2 Corinthians he says, God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. And in verses 6 through 9 of our lesson this morning, they are so powerful to teach this as well. Paul says, you see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have been justified by his blood, how much more then shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? God is a good judge, 
He's a fair judge. He's a judge that condemns the wicked and justifies the righteous. But he and his son made a plan so that there could be more people who were justified and designated as righteous. Prior to Jesus' birth, the total righteous population of earth when it came to the works of the law was zero. From the day Jesus was born until the day he died, that number shot up to a solid one. And all of a sudden, with Christ's death, there was one extra who was condemned, who shouldn't have been. But the number of justified began to increase more and more, and it's continuing to increase to this day. Christ took our sins upon himself willingly, and so took that condemnation that we deserved. God did not look past those sins like a lousy judge. He punished them through the death of his own son and by letting his blood flow down that cross. And it was the kind of punishment that we should have been destined for, not only the death itself, but to face the wrath of God, to stand before the judge covered in all those sins that we carried ourselves. But Christ willingly took those sins upon himself so that we didn't have to stand before God looking like this. He went before God looking like this himself. He died for sinners, not for good righteous men, because there was no way any of us could ever be that anyway. But it goes a step beyond that. Christ took our, took our sins upon himself and what we get, and what ultimately defines us as righteous and fully justifies us in the eyes of God, is that we gain Christ's righteousness. Paul says just a few verses beyond today's passage in 519, through the obedience of one man, the many will be made righteous. And that verse from 2 Corinthians I quoted just a few minutes ago, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, ends by saying so that we might become the righteousness of God. Because of God's righteousness, or Christ's righteousness, I'd rather, and his obedient life, he didn't deserve to die. But because he died holding all our sins upon himself, we have his righteousness imputed to us. And it gives us the full measure of our justification. God looks at us and sees the righteousness of Christ instead of our sins. Not that we are finished with all our sins after we're justified. God has not taken all our sins out of our life and said Christ's righteousness covers only what was in the past. You have to rely on your own for your future. The heart of justification is simply God's declaration of Christ's righteousness onto your life for your past, present, and your future. And that's one of the major heartstrings of this letter to the Romans. That through Christ's blood, we have been completely and fully justified of all wrongdoing that we would otherwise be condemned for. Not like Walter McMillan, because it never happened, but because God in his love sent his son, and his son willingly took up the cross, took up our sins on himself, and puts upon us his righteousness, his perfect obedience to everything the Father wants to see in his people. And of course, the primary argument of Romans is how we receive that justification. God's blood made it possible. Sorry, Christ's blood made it possible. But Paul, again and again, says it is a free gift, an act of God's grace. We can't do anything to get it. Our future life does not need to look a certain way to earn it. We don't need to be baptized or take communion a certain number of times. We don't need to tithe or turn to the life of a monk or anything like that. It comes to us by God's grace his unmerited favor toward each one of us. God didn't have to do it. If he did, it could hardly be called an act of grace. It'd be an obligation. God's not obliged to do anything for unrighteous sinners like us who deserve condemnation. But he did it anyway. God showed his love to us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. But what Paul does stress is that grace and that justification does come through faith. In our passage last week, Paul says God gave us Christ as our propitiation so as to be just and to be the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. And in Galatians, he tells that church, we believed in Christ in order to be justified by faith in Christ, not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one shall be justified. We can't be justified on our own. It must come through faith. Not because faith somehow is better or earns us any merit before God, but because faith is the exact opposite attitude of depending on ourselves and trying to earn something. We cannot be righteous in this life. It will not happen. We cannot be justified by anything we do, 
not by trying to be better next time, not by performing some religious practices, not by being nicer to people. It just can't be done. The damage of our sin is too powerful a thing to have us then justify ourselves later. So by faith, we look to Christ and say, I give up trying to justify myself. You, Lord, have made a way, and I'll trust you to take care of it. Take my sin, take my unrighteousness, take my condemnation, and take my punishment. I entrust it all to you because I know there is nothing else I can do to get rid of it. And there's nothing I can do to get from where I am to where I hope to be with it. And that is in the presence of a perfect and holy God who cannot ever be near a condemned, unrighteous, unholy sinner like me. So by faith, I trust that Jesus Christ will take care of that problem for me, and all my sins will be laid upon him, so his righteousness can then be laid upon me. The justification that we receive through Christ's blood has some practical imp implications for us too. First, it offers hope to all who know they can never make themselves righteous before God. Salvation is and only ever will be a free gift that God has extended to the world through his grace. He made it freely, freely available to all people who trust in him to take our sins upon him and declare us no longer to be sinners but righteous in his sight. That freedom that comes from the truth can be the breaking point that takes someone who thinks they could never be good enough to be a Christian, never be good enough for God to accept them and instead make them realize the amazing love and grace God has extended to the world through the shedding of his blood. Finally, it gives us the confidence that God will never make us pay for our sins. The wrath we worried about and feared last week through the propitiation made by Christ's blood, and now we add to that the justification we have through that blood. That fear of wrath and punishment is gone. It is God who justifies. Who is it then that could condemn us? God will forever and always look at those who have faith in Christ's blood and what it's accomplished for them and only see that they are justified. The sins I committed 10 years ago, the sins I committed yesterday and today, the sins I should be condemned for 10 years from now, God is never going to punish us for them. Jesus took them upon himself on the cross. And so now we all stand before God, our judge, just like Walter McMillan stood before his judges. And God has said, you are not guilty on all charges. You are righteous forever and able to walk around as a free man. So as we go forward, remembering Christ's sacrifice this Lenten season, and whenever we celebrate his last supper with his disciples, we remember that the cup is Christ's blood that was shed for our justification. Let's bow our heads and pray. Well, Father God, we thank you so much that even though there was nothing we could do with our sin, that your son decided to take it upon himself. Take the punishment we deserve, take the condemnation that we had earned, and instead give us his righteousness so that we can be justified through him. We just pray, Lord, thanking you for that great gift and pray that we can lean on it each and every day. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would everybody please stand for the benediction? I have a change of shirt for anybody who wants hugs after worship. <laughs> Our benediction this morning comes from the book of Hebrews. May the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. <laughs>
Thank you. 